What's going on, Journey Church? How are you doing today? My name is Pastor Phil Curlin, and I have the privilege of being a part of this amazing church and this amazing team. Come on, I wanna welcome everybody that's joining us at our Fairview Park campus. Let me hear you, Fairview Park, Twinsburg, Avon. Let's welcome all of our campuses today. And how about those that are joining us online as well, including my mom. Hi, mom, good to see you. And Pastor Jim and Jen joining us online today. Yeah, we love you, pastors. In fact, I'd like to take a moment before we get into today's message just to give you an update on our pastors. Uh, on October 29th, Pastor Jim went into the hospital for a scheduled heart surgery, and praise God, the surgery was a success. Yes, <laughs> miracle after miracle, right? Uh, he was home and recovering, and then this past Monday, he ran into a little bit of a speed bump, uh, had some complications while he was at home, and ended up back in the hospital where he is now, ministering, prophesying, praying, healing, recovering, and our pastor and his wife and family are so grateful for all of your prayers, all of your support, and your encouragement. Uh, pastor Jim is scheduled for a kind of quick less invasive procedure uh, tomorrow, and then our hope and prayer is for him to go home shortly thereafter for a complete and total healing recovery, and we believe it by faith in Jesus' name at every campus. We celebrate what God has done, what he will do. Like I said, miracle after miracle after miracle. Well, again, I'm, I'm Pastor Phil, and I'm excited to jump into part two of our legacy series this month. Pastor Jim and Pastor John Michael I kicked that series off last week, and so if you missed it, make sure you go online to our website, journey.church, or on YouTube, Facebook, find that word, get it in your heart. Pastor Jim and Pastor John Michael set the foundation for what I really believe is a watershed moment for our church. You know, every year since the very beginning, we have received an offering above and beyond our tithes. We bring our tithes, we give our offering. And this year's legacy offering is gonna be a little bit different. It's a three-year campaign where our faith goal is to raise $15 million. How is that gonna be possible, God? Partnering together with your prayers, come on, and your generosity, to see a miracle happen, right? Yeah. That's how, but why? Why would we do this? Because we believe that the local church, this local church, is called to be a city on a hill. And we believe that a lifetime is too long to wait for hope. And so we're praying, we're believing, we want you to pray and believe with us how God might have you participate, how he might have you partner with us in your generosity when we receive our offering on December the 1st. Well, hey, listen, if you have your Bible, let's jump into God's word today. First Kings chapter 17, you can turn to First Kings 17 or open the Journey app. Open the Journey app, click on the Bible button, and then navigate to 1 Kings chapter 17. As you're turning there, I gotta set the context for you, because you're not gonna get the most out of this word if you don't have understanding of what was going on in 1 Kings chapter 17. So it was 2,500 years ago, okay? It was the year 587 B.C., and the people of God, the Israelites, they had turned away from Yahweh, God, and they had been worshiping false gods that were brought to them by the seventh consecutive ruthless king. His name, King Ahab. Now, King Ahab, he's a bad dude. And what made it even worse is that he was married to Jezebel. I mean, it's okay to be married. Y'all were like, wait, what? I'm married to, love my wife. Thing is, thanks be to God that my wife's not Jezebel. See, if you know, then you know. But if you don't know, let me just tell you, not only was King Ahab a bad dude, but his wife Jezebel, she was a pagan false god worshiper. 
the God that she worshiped, that the people began to worship when they turned away from Yahweh, was a God named Baal, B-A-A-L, if you're taking notes. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 33, it says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings before him. Yo, it was not a good scene. And it's right here in the story that this prophet man, this man of God named Elijah, look at your neighbor, tell him Elijah. Elijah walks up into King Ahab's business and he drops it on him. First Kings 17 verse one. Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to King Ahab, as the Lord the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Yo, you don't even know how baller that is. I mean, that is like mic drop moment for this dude to walk into King Ahab's presence and just drop that proclamation. And then this is what verse two says. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan, you will drink from the brook and I have directed what? the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Now listen, I know we're in Cleveland and we're Browns fans, so the word Ravens is a dirty word as it is, okay? But can I just remind you or tell you if you don't know that what Ravens eat, first of all, they're unclean birds, okay? And what they eat is roadkill. Thanks God for sending me to a place of hiding, if I'm Elijah, sending me to a place of hiding to drink out of a brook and eat half-chewed, saliva-filled roadkill spit out of the mouth of those dirty Baltimore Ravens. No thank you. <clears throat> That's not even the sermon. I just had to get it out of my system. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came, go at once, Elijah, to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. Why? I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Hopefully it's better than the ravens and the roadkill. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. Why was she gathering sticks? Wait for it. Elijah calls to the widow and asks, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get the water, he called, and, pre and bring me please a piece of bread. Verse 12. <laughs> I love this. The widow goes, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. And you may tell you why I'm gathering a few sticks so I can take them home, make a meal for myself and my son so that we could eat it and die. Yo, if I'm Elijah, I'm like, send me back to the raven feeding brook of the Kareth Ravine. I just insulted this woman. I am so sorry. Thing is, I'm not Elijah. Thing is, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Thing is, Elijah obeyed the word of the Lord. Thing is, Elijah did what the Lord told him to do. If you ever find yourself wondering, what am I supposed to do? Let me tell you what to do. Go back to the last thing the Lord said. If you're not finding blessing, peace, or provision in your right here and now, let me just challenge you with this. What did he tell you to do? Did you do it? Because you won't get to the next until you do the last thing that God told you to do, okay? So he says to this woman, thanks for the water. Could I have some food too? She's like, yo, bro, I'm about to die with this last little bit of food that I have. And Elijah says, verse 13, I want you to see this. Elijah says to her, what I believe to be prophetic in the year 2024 in Cleveland, Ohio, at Journey Church, he says four words that changed everything. He said, do not be afraid. And I'm saying it as a mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit to somebody online at Avon, at Twinsburg, here in the room, at Fairview Park. I'm saying, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I know what it looks like. I know what it feels like. 
I know that days have become weeks. I know that weeks have become months. I know that maybe months have become years. I know you've been waiting on God, come on somebody, to show up in some kind of way for year after year after year. Can I just tell you, if it's not done yet, then God's still working. If it's not good yet, then God is still working. I don't think you're getting it. I'm talking about the God who saves, the God who heals, the God who provides, the way-making God that we're singing about today. Do not be afraid. And so then the woman in hearing this, say, Elijah says, go home, make me this bread. Make, you know, uh, go do as you've said, make me the bread and bring it to me and make something for yourself and your son. And so the woman hears this and, said, and, and Elijah says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord sends rain. This is a promise. Elijah gives her a command. Come on, somebody. But then he gives her a promise. And she has a decision to make. What's she gonna do with what she just heard? I got a news flash for you. The fact that you're in the room or listening right now, what you gonna do with what you about to hear? You're either going to obey or not. And this woman, verse 15, says she went away and she did as Elijah told her. And what happened? When she obeyed, what happened? It says every day there was food for Elijah, the woman, and her family. And, and, the, and the jar of flour and the jug of oil, they weren't used up. They didn't run dry. What was supposed to be one meal's worth lasted, and it was enough for her, for the prophet, for her family. Can I just tell you, her last, her little bit of last, became his first meal, and God multiplied it. I wonder what happens when you give your little bit of last to a thing called legacy, and God receives it. As a, as a first fruit, and God multiplies it, and everything changes for you and for the people that God's put into your life. What happens if Elijah doesn't go to Zarephath? Does the woman eat her last meal and die? What happens if he's disobedient and he stays in the care of the ravine eating from ravens? Now, I'm just gonna stay right here, God. At least it's comfortable. By the way, you want me to tell you how long the journey was from Kareth Ravine to Zarephath? 80 miles by foot. And oh, by the way, it was the middle of a famine that lasted three and a half years. That's why the, the brook drew, uh, dried up because there was no rain, no rain, no brook. Dude walks 85 miles to a widow. Now, I want you to listen to me because this would have been shocking for the man of God to travel 85 miles to go to a widow woman who was a Gentile. Strike three, right? Like the Jewish people, the leadership of the day would not have respected women, would not have respected widows, and they sure as heck would not have respected a Gentile, somebody who was not Jewish. And yet, this is how God chose to provide for his prophet Elijah. I wanna, I wanna talk to you today from the topic of trust and obey. Some of you, maybe you remember that old Sunday school song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Can I tell you that like in this story, for your life, could it be that the provision of God could come from an unexpected place, from an unexpected, une, unexpected source, at an unexpected time. It would have been shocking for Elijah to expect this pagan woman to provide him with what he needed. In fact, so shocking, let me prove it to you. Jesus, let's go to the New Testament, Luke chapter four, if you wanna flip there, Luke chapter four. Jesus leaves the desert. He's been tempted for 40 days. Remember this? He's been tempted for 40 days by the devil. He leaves the desert. 
He finds himself in the temple. He starts his public ministry. He walks into the temple, into the church, and the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, they hand him a scroll. He unrolls the scroll and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. He announces his public ministry. It's amazing. He says things like, the spirit of the Lord is on me, Luke chapter four, I, uh, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Come on, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolls up the scroll, gives it back to the attendants and sits down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue are fascinated, are, are, are fastened on him. And he began by saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So far, so good. In fact, the next verse, Luke chapter four, verse 22 says, everyone spoke well of him and they were amazed at the words that came from his lips. But keep reading because this is shocking, right? Jesus just finished being tempted. He walks into the, uh, into the temple. He announces his ministry. He says, this word is fulfilled in your hearing. And then verse 24, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of the Jewish widows. No, he was sent to a pagan nowhereville city called Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, by the way, Naaman was the commanding officer of the army that kept defeating the Israelite army. People didn't like Naaman. And yet Jesus talks about a Gentile widow and a Gentile army officer. And the next verse says the people got so mad at his, Jesus' reference to the widow and to Naaman that they drove him towards the cliff to kill him. That's how insulting it would have been for Jesus to provide this update to the people of the church for God to provide for his prophet Elijah through a widow in Zarephath. This is what it tells me. Why did I go through all that? This is the meat of it. When I read 1 Kings 17 about the provision of God through a widow, Gentile woman, and then I read Luke chapter four where Jesus is talking about the same widow and a Gentile man named Naaman who was healed of leprosy, this is what it says. This is what it's saying. It's saying. The gospel is for everybody. The gospel is for everybody. It's for your neighbor. It's for your coworker. It's for people that don't look like you. It's for people that don't vote like you. It's for people that have the, the flag of the other candidate hanging in their, yard, their window or posted in their yard. Don't be the reason that somebody misses out on the gospel message because of your preferences, your prejudices, or your insecurities. Oh, I feel like preaching this. I feel like sometimes we complain about right where we are and ask God to get us out of it, but what if he puts you right where you are because he wants you in it? What if the neighbor, coworker, friend, student next to you in the dorm, what if God puts you there to bring the gospel to them? Even though they don't vote like you, look like you, sound like you, worship like you, man, the gospel's for everybody. Listen, if you keep reading 1 Kings 17, you know what happens? The widow's son dies. What if the widow doesn't obey Elijah? When her son dies, in case you don't know, Elijah resurrects, through the power of God, resurrects the son back to life. You see, your obedience to God's word and your trust in his provision is everything. You either trust and obey, or quite frankly, you don't. There's no middle ground, friends. The question is not, do I qualify or do I have what it takes to be saved? The question is, will you repent and believe? And if you've never made that decision today, before our time is up, we're gonna give you an opportunity to repent, to believe, and to accept Jesus Christ as your savior. The gospel is for everybody, and that includes you. Amen. 
Have you ever found yourself thinking, I am willing, but I don't have much? Anybody, show of hands? Is it just me? Okay, a couple of us. I'm willing to help out, but I don't know if I can. I'm willing, but, but, I, but I don't have that much, Pastor Phil. I would if I could, but I can't, so I don't or won't. What if we could change that mindset? How do we change that mindset? You, you think about what you do have. Instead of thinking about your lack, you think about what you do have, little or big as it may be. I mean, to everybody else, Moses was carrying a stick like anybody in the wilderness would do, a little walking stick. But a stick, come on somebody, in the hand of a prophet that has the faith to trust and obey, when stretched out, caused the sea to split. What do you have? You got a little bit of oil? You got a little bit of flour? What do you have? You have a word of encouragement for your neighbor? You have a prayer that you can pray? You have a little bit of joy that you can share with a, with a friend? You got a little bit of patience to listen to somebody that's hard to listen to? What do you have? I submit to you that right where you are is right where you're supposed to be right now. And right what you have is what God would have you to have. If he wanted you to have more, he'd give it to you. Maybe, maybe you don't have the more you've been praying for because you didn't steward well the last. Sorry, I'm preaching to myself too. You don't get the more by being jealous, envious, or desirous of, of somebody else's. What do you have? What you have, partner with the power of God, could split a sea. What you have, partner with the power of God, could feed a prophet, yourself, your son, and your whole family. What I'm trying to tell you this weekend is what do you have? Do not be afraid. God is feeding his people. Right in the midst of the election of 2024, God is feeding his people. Right in the midst of chaos and insecurity, God is feeding his people. You can always trust the provision of God, but only if you obey his word. When you don't know what to do, do you ask Alexa or God's word? When you don't have the faith to believe, do you search Google or God's word? When you aren't sure which way to go with your business, do you ask Siri or God's word? What I'm trying to say is that there's power in the word of God. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It's for then, it's for now, it never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Obey God's word. Watch what happens. God has a plan. He does. It just might look different than you thought. It might look like ravens. It might look like a widow. But God has a plan. And the crazy thing to me is, that this prophet Elijah, I really want you to catch this. Come on, Fairview, lean in. Twinsburg, lean in. Elijah is trusting and obeying in God's word even when everyone in his nation is not. He stands up when everybody else turns away from God to lesser things. He says, uh-uh, I'm gonna stay right here and trust and obey in the word of God. I'm gonna trust in the provision of God. Now, everyone in this nation gave up on God, forgot about his faithfulness, and they started worshiping Ahab and Jezebel's false god named Baal. I'm not saying that you are worshiping Baal, but are you worshiping TikTok? What's the name of your false god? Is it ESPN? Is it the comfort that you seek? Is it your bank account? What's the name of your false idol God? I, I, Lord, search my heart. You might be listening, but the Lord's preaching to me right now. I feel like in 2024, it's like 587 BC. We live in a nation where people have turned away from the faithfulness of God and they've turned to Donald Trump. 
They've turned to Kamala Harris. They've turned to Joe Biden. They've turned to the Supreme Court. They've turned to Taylor Swift. They've turned to Facebook. They turn to fill in the blank. Can I just tell you whether you're overjoyed with the election results or completely dismayed, Jesus Christ sits on the throne. He's king of kings. He's lord of lords. He's not shaken. He's not caught off guard. This too shall pass or this too shall be blessed. However you want to see it. All I know is if God could show up during King Ahab's time, God could show up during Biden, Harris, Trump, you name it. God is the king of the universe. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things. Facebook, TikTok, Tesla, Michigan Wolverines. Well, there's something wrong with that. I told you we're gonna have salvation at the end of our message. We're gonna have prayer and deliverance, get the anointing oil out. The, the thing I'm trying to say is, whatever gets your primary attention, whatever becomes the object of your affection more than God is a false God bail. And so today, at the end of our time, when our prayer teams come forward and we stand in worship, you may need to repent like I did this week. You may need to repent and say, God, unknowingly, Father, forgive me, I didn't even realize that I was putting on the throne of glory a sports team, a habit, a, a, a sense of pleasure, a comfort, when the only thing that should be on that throne is Jesus Christ. And I wanna give you the opportunity at the end of our time to repent. I want you to obey God's word. And then secondly, I want you to trust in the Lord's provision. It's God's job to provide. That's what he does. He's pretty good at it. It's your job to ask, to receive, and to learn how to be satisfied. Father, help us today to learn how to be satisfied. You know what is the enemy of satisfaction? Expectation. I'll say it again. You know what prevents me? Maybe you can agree. If so, just nod your head. You know what I struggle with in trying to be satisfied? It's because I have expectations of God. Like to do it a certain way in a certain time frame. And especially when it goes the way it wasn't supposed to go. Hello. I get a little shaken. But what if, what if we could be people that plant our feet on the firm foundation of God's word and to trust God to provide when he wants, how he wants, through who he wants. You see, th this is how God gave it to me. I hope it makes sense. The distance between your expectations of God and the reality of how and when he provides it determines your level of disappointment. The distance between your expectations, God, do it this way, and the reality of how he does it, when he does it, that the greater the distance, the bigger the disappointment. I'm not saying it's wrong to expect from God. It's great to expect from God. Come into his presence with thanksgiving, with praise, with expectation, but surrender your expectation and say, God, however you wanna do it, I surrender. Whenever you wanna do it, I surrender. Can't you see that if he did it through ravens, if he did it through a, a Gentile widow, can't you, if he did it through a baby born in a manger, can't you see that God oftentimes does it, I'll tell you this way, he always does it his way. Because his way is better. He knows what he's doing. Well, what do I do when I don't, understand it when I can't make sense of it. What do I do, God? I lean into his word and the promise of Ephesians 3.20 that God can do immeasurably more than even what I expect, all that I could imagine, all that I could think or ask. You know, when you read God's word and you obey it, it builds your trust. And when you trust in God's provision, it leads you to obey his word. You see, trust and obedience, they work together. I'll show you one last thing. 
before we have a time of ministry. In Matthew, Jesus is speaking to his followers. It's in the red letters. In chapter six, verse 26, you probably heard the verse. It says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And we read verse 26, and you know, we, we get excited about the provision of God, and we should. But if you read verse 26 without verse 25, friends, you miss it. And that's what I did and I, as I was preparing for this message. I, it's verse 25 caught my eye when I read verse 26. I wanna show it to you. Verse 25 says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Hello. What you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. We have expectations. We have a choice to make, to trust and obey God. God will provide, that's what the scripture says. But it's not, listen to me, it's not just about his provision. It's about his love. He says, do not worry, I got you. Because I got you, you've got this. For God so loved the world that he gave provision for salvation his son, Jesus. You see, we serve a God of love. Some of us need to repent from worshiping only the hand of God instead of pursuing the heart of God. It's not wrong to receive from the hand of God. He's a good God, he wants to bless you, he has blessed you, me included. But what does it look like to enter a time of prayer first seeking his heart before seeking from his hand? Of provision. The only way to do that is to know and obey his promises. And when we read scriptures that say, train a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart, we can hold on to that when our kids get all crazy as they get older. And we can declare and believe in the promise of God. And when we read a promise that says God has plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you hope in a future, you can hold on to that. But if you don't know and obey God's promises, what are you left with? Worry, striving, anxiety. I wanna, I wanna give you my little formula, okay? Trusting in God's word, Believing in his promises equals peace. In fact, God's so good. He doesn't, it's not just obey his word plus trust in his provision plus believe his promises equals peace. God's so good, he gives you peace. And when, when pain comes, he gives you purpose for that pain. And you can stand up tall and say, I don't know why it's this way, but I know I serve a God who's a way maker. I don't know how long, how much longer it's gonna be this way, but I choose to trust and obey. Could you close your eyes and bow your head at every campus? God, today we repent for putting our faith, our trust in whatever false God that you bring to our mind right now. God, for many of us, we didn't even mean to. We maybe didn't even know it till just this moment. But we repent and we put you back on your throne, King Jesus. God, for everyone in the room that feels like quitting, they feel like it's been too long and if you were gonna do it, you would have done it by now. I pray right now that perseverance would finish its work in them, that they wouldn't quit, that they wouldn't grow weary in their well-doing because at just the right time, I declare, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. So don't give up today. Don't you give up on your marriage. Don't you give up on your education. Don't you give up on that promise God spoke to you. 
He's working, he's moving. He is who he says he is. He's gonna do what he said he's gonna do. It might look different, but he's faithful. God, today we choose to trust and obey you.